Well, hi everyone. A warm welcome from my side. It's my pleasure today to kick us off into the day on connectivity. Unfortunately, I can't see you, but it's good to know that you are out there and we are somehow connected. Connectivity is absolutely fundamental to manage the energy transition towards a sustainable future. It's about connecting and integrating millions of renewable energy sources, making them work and making the whole system work. And um, it is mission critical. It is also about connecting people, enabling and empowering communities. And at the end of the day, connectivity is about human connection. Before I get to the energy connectivity and what that all means, I would like to actually talk in more fundamental terms and give some different aspects of connectivity. And connectivity is a what I call a suitcase term. It's so broad that you basically can put anything into that suitcase. It can mean anything but nothing in that sense. But connectivity is actually extremely um, fundamental. And um, it is fundamental in the sense of if you go to the elementary part of the world, it's about all interactions of particles, small particles. It's about exchanging actually information. And the world is made of those interactions. It's the grammar of the world. And we change in relation to each other. So think of atoms, of molecules, solid states. And when more particles interact, like in systems, they have different emerging properties that are very interesting. Just a few examples, what one doesn't think of naturally. Take biological connectivity. Think of a system with fungi and trees that build a symbiotic connection, where actually the trees deliver carbon in form of sugar, and the fungi give back to the trees minerals like nitrogen and um, phosphorus. So that is one sort of connectivity that works in nature. Think of human connection. We are all connected to each other. We have friends, family, we have remote friends. And don't think of your Facebook friends now. Just think of normal, direct, personal interaction. How many steps do you think it would take to get to know Michelle Obama or the Pope or Jeff Bezos? It actually takes only six steps to get there. Only six steps. We're all connected to each other without the Internet. That is quite amazing. Or think of a different connectivity because it's about this exchange of information. Did you know that humans in cities, in large cities, they simply walk faster? So every time a city size doubles, we increase our speed of walking on average by 10%. And um, of course, there is a natural limit which is given by biology and our physical ability. But these are examples of connectivity that I think we don't think of. But connectivity is everywhere. The things that we usually think of when we think about and talk about connectivity is probably talking about gadgets, smartphones, mobile phones, Internet of Things. For that, we need mobile networks. We need broadband networks. We need the Internet. And um, we also need energy for all of that. And this is, of course, where the energy networks come into play. They need to fuel, they need to energize all these gadgets. And now, turning to digital connectivity, by 2030, we will have a mind-blowing number of 500 billion devices connected to each other, communicating, exchanging information. And that also means that we see an increasing electricity demand by then. So 15% of power in 2030 will be just consumed by data centers with an increasing demand on electricity because the world is getting more electric. And it's getting more electric because we add wind power, solar power, that uses the wind and the sun to turn this into electricity. 
And what is very important in my view to understand about the energy sector, it is one of three, if not four, what I call general purpose infrastructure. Every single society, every single um, country is based on the functioning of fundamental infrastructures. First, we have the communication infrastructure. It's to ensure that we can communicate each other, we can call each other, we can send emails, we exchange data. This is very fundamental and that is fueled and enabled by networks. The second one is the mobility sector. So we can exchange goods, we can travel from A to B, using cars, having roads, bridges. This is very essential. But all this only works on the basis of a functioning and safe and reliable energy infrastructure based on networks. And underpinned, there is an emerging layer, which I call the data and AI layer, because data and digital intelligence is increasing. So what are the two big challenges we have, in my view, when we talk about energy, the future of digitization ahead of us? First, it's addressing climate change, finding quickly a solution. We do not have much time left. And to do that, we secondly have to rebuild the entire energy infrastructure. And given the complexity of that energy infrastructure and that system, this simply takes time and is a complex undertaking and requires a lot of different building blocks. Just one reminder on climate change, how serious it is. This is a picture that shows the evolution of the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, measured usually in parts per million. And this picture goes back to 400,000 years. I will not explain how this can be measured, but one can measure it quite accurately. And yes, CO2 levels have fluctuated in the past, as p many people say, but always to a level of 300 BPM. And today we are at 412, and this all happened since we are burning the fossil fuels and the industrialization second wave really started after 1950. So, that is climate change. For that, we have to rebuild the energy infrastructure. And what is important there, and that's what we do at E.ON, is first the grid, the glue that connects everyone, connects people, connects devices, creates communities, is absolutely critical. And for that, we need to increase the capacity, capacity in terms of size, but also capacity in terms of capabilities, intelligence, more silicon, more software goes into networks. The other part is what happens at the edge of the grid, where the connection, where the things get connected. And this is the grid edge. And I will just give you a few examples of, of both. So first, on energy networks. Just to give you an idea on the, on the EON networks and the power and the size and the size of the challenge this is. So we run at E.ON about 1.6 million kilometers of networks. We are approaching a million decentral assets connected to this grid that produce energy in an unforeseeable kind of stochastic way. And then you have to manage the stability of a grid, which is quite a complex undertaking. We serve on the edge 50 million customers. We see a growing number of electric vehicle chargers connected to the grid that add another challenge because it requires a lot of power, sometimes at the same point in time where the grid has to be able to deliver that kind of power. And what we do in the grid is many things in terms of making the grid more resilient and intelligent. One example is, for instance, a great example where we are putting so much intelligence into the system that in real time we can connect renewable sources with, with the demand side, with people who need electricity. We create prosumers, smaller islands of systems that self-orchestrate to then actually use less copper and don't that so that we also don't have to curtail, cut off renewable energies when there's too much and the grid can't take it. So it's about planning and making the system work in real time, optimization. 
on the grid edge, a lot of things happen. A lot of people talk about the necessary energy transition. And as a matter of fact, if, you, if we want to be successful, that means by the same token that we have to basically rebuild the energy infrastructure of every single city, of every single industry that consumes energy. Because 70% of the emissions stem from cities, where people live, where they work, where they, they are connected. And I also think that a lot of production industries have maybe the next 10 years to make the move towards sustainable energy. Otherwise, I don't think consumers will necessarily accept production. So this is the challenge. And just two examples that explain what we do here at Xeon. An example is London, where we, for instance, at the moment have 60 heat networks in the heart of London. And we're making them more and more fossil-free so usually we reduce CO2 by 50, 60 percent. We run those networks on low temperatures to reduce the losses. And we connect them. Someone is heating, someone needs cooling. And this connected networks means we are serving city quarters. We do something similar in Malmö and an increasing number of projects in Berlin, in Munich, across Europe. And I think the task of the future is to accelerate that change. And I really hope also that the Green Deal that was announced by the European Union fuels and accelerates that necessary change. We also have projects which are very innovative, using hydrogen with low temperature grids, e-mobility networks, and connecting all these assets steered through an intelligent network. And for many of those solutions, we even create a simulation in the digital space, which is a one-to-one -one mirror image of what happens in reality. And that allows us to optimize that and reduce CO2 even further. Another example is complete energy autonomy. And um, this is a fantastic example in Sweden, where about a village with 50, 60 homes, is actually kind of going off-grid. So they use batteries, solar panels, wind power to optimize their energy demand, and they only use the grid as a backup. That was unthinkable 20 years ago. But today, with software, with data, to manage this connection, to manage actually supply and demand in real time, is, I think, um, very empowering. And in that sense, the energy revolution, which is not just creating sustainability, it actually makes energy accessible to individuals. Think of your own home, when you could have your own solar panel on the roof, a battery in the storage. You can trade eventually, at some point, energy. And of course, this all needs to also happen within a regulatory framework. So I think a lot of work also needs to happen in the, in the context of uh, regulation. And clearly, all this fundamental mission-critical infrastructure has to be safe and secure. And that's why cybersecurity um, is of utmost importance. And that's why a large part of our investment, for instance, our networks, 10-15%, depending on how you look at it, is actually um, already uh, going into the networks to make sure we can make them resilient and, and, and reliant. And I think this is one of the biggest challenges also of decentral networks going forward that we have to work on. So, in summary, the connectivity in the energy space, fueling all the other connectivities in the digital era, also, human life um, needs sustainable connectivity, and that requires green energy. And that means it's a massive job to rebuild that whole energy infrastructure that actually was built over 100 years. In a relative short period of time, all this needs to change, fueled and managed by the grid. And last but not least, again, it is 
all about human connection. And this is what E.ON is all about. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wilberger. Very interesting insight into what connectivity really means. And we have a lot of questions coming from the audience already, so we'll jump right into it. Um, the first one is a very general one, um, picking up where you said there are two big challenges. One has to do with climate change. The other one is about rebuilding this energy system. Um, what does connectivity mean for innovation in this industry, in this sector? Yeah. Well, I think... First of all, from a systemic point of view, to manage connectivity on such a small scale, moving from a large scale to a small scale system with intermittent sources requires a totally different way of managing the whole system. And that requires innovation. Secondly, to enable and to innovate decentral energy sources, think of batteries, think of the new frontier of uh, solar, mat uh, solar material like perovskite, etc. All those things also need to be developed. We will see, we also need to think of gas and hydrogen. I think that was also on yesterday, uh, fuel cells. So there is a lot of work on the hardware side, on the software side, and on the system side, how to manage that all. So I think without innovation, we wouldn't be here today where we are, and the future can only be mastered if we add and accelerate that innova innovative path we are on. And maybe to do that, to get to the innovation that you require for this, uh, what, what is your take on working with startups as E.ON to, to leverage that customer base? Well, we work in the past, um, and we work today with lots of startups. We are also invested in startups. I think um, it's... Uh, what we offer to startups in particular is that we offer them our customer base. So we think we can use their products, their innovation to bring it into our base to use that. And, um, and it helps them to scale. So basically have a better market access. I think the biggest challenge for large companies in general with startup companies is how do you make sure that the things you do on a, say, smaller scale in the startup and a big company with all our processes, how do we scale? How do we really make this a tremendous market success? This is um, not that easy. Um, and sometimes it works, but very often it doesn't work. But uh, very important to, to, to have that connection with the startup scene and what's going on there. That brings me to one question. Um, there, once a startup, but Tesla is not a startup anymore. Now they are here. They entered the German market, and they they want to get not only into electric vehicles, but they provide out of sudden they provide um, solar, and there is batteries involved. So, do you see Tesla as a threat or an opportunity for Eon? Well, I think um, Tesla um, builds a very impressive ecosystem. Right? It starts, of course, it starts with a car, which is connected. It's the most connected car. It's a data producing vehicle. And uh, e-mobility makes only sense if you use green energy. So for me, a natural extension for them is to go into solar, they did in the US, to actually also with their auto beta platform to try to access local energy markets and manage this ecosystem. So I think the market is big and complex enough, but I think what Tesla does um, they force us to think harder and be faster. So when it comes to so-called flexibility, solutions that offer, you know, connecting this very complex world and um, make it more resilient, um, this is something that just forces us to accelerate. And um, so we take them very seriously, but I have to say um, they, have, they are on a fantastic path. Mm -hmm. Great, great. But let's also not forget the energy sector, because it is a, such a mission-critical system, yeah. it will always require regulation. Mm -hmm. And the complexity of regulation is not like a free world. We have to make sure that the lights are always on. I think that's something that our people and we ourselves and our customers realized during COVID time. So we had colleagues who went into quarantine themselves to make sure they could make sure the networks are up and running. So it's not like you can just build any piece of software and put it out there and, and it's, it's working. So you have to also um, 
play by the rules. Right. So that speaks to the level of risk involved in doing all Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Right. So th there's a question again about batteries. Um, do you plan to produce batteries for electric cars and to create connections with VW, BMW, Mercedes, etc.? Well, I do not think that we would be necessarily the best producer of that kind of hardware. Yeah? That's not our home turf. But what we do do is we partner and with hardware manufacturers, with automotive com uh, uh, companies, to make sure we bring the devices into the homes of people, into the homes or into businesses, and integrate them into our network. And even if we didn't do that, we still have to integrate them into networks and make them work. Another big example is where we add intelligence to those storages, like vehicle-to-grid projects, which we do with automotive companies. And I think um, that is an area where we are very active. But I think when it comes to really chemistry, material science, there are better guys out there. All right. And they have faced similar challenges than you. Um, there's a question, maybe a more general one, but what do you think the top two technical challenges are in connectivity and energy? And then maybe top two regular, regulatory ones. Yeah, the, the very first one I think is when you think of uh, the renewable side, um, especially in countries like Germany or in many parts of Europe, just to think of an, a green electric world at any point in time without storage, um, long-term storage, it's very difficult. So we need something in between that solves the question of long-term storage. And then you always get back to gas. Mm. So how do you, and which kind of gas? And then it comes to synthetic gases, then you come to actually um, hydrogen. But that will still take some time. So using renewables energies when you have in excess of it and then producing gas or hydrogen to transport it and then use electrolysis to produce energy and electricity again is something I think which, uh, which will be necessary. So we need this missing piece which I think gas is so important. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think it's very critical that from a societal perspective we realize that the gas sector will be key to manage the transition. So what can't happen is that we treat gas as the new coal because then we will not be able to arrive at this hopefully sustainable future. And that does not happen overnight. So we need to be also aware of that. So that's point number one. The second one is on regulation. I think the regulatory framework, because a lot of things that are happening out there is the combination of hardware and software using data algorithms, AI, another suitcase term, mm -hmm. to manage all that. And we need the regulatory framework that encourages the implementation of such tools much faster. Mm -hmm. Of course, they come with also a lot of efficiency gains, but I think uh, the regulatory framework, I think, needs to incentivize that innovat innovative push a bit more in order to accelerate. These were the things that would cross my mind. Thank you. Um, a question by Alex is, what is, what is E.ON doing to connect all 50 million customers it has across Europe, help them to be more efficient and sustainable? <laughs> Well, I wish there would be a switch and you could just do it <laughs> yeah. like that. But because usually also hardware is involved, that takes a bit of time. Mm -hmm. But I'll give you um, a few examples of uh, what we do. Is, for instance, we are installing across Europe a very substantial number of uh, solar panels, batteries, chargers in people's homes. And we call this a future energy home. Mm -hmm. It's like a thing which makes you a bit more autonomous. And in that software that you use to manage that system, you know, you can actually do your planning when the sun is shining, how you use your energy. You could actually also very soon create communities where the electricity that one produces can be used by someone else. So we call it a virtual community, but it's actually quite a real community, human connect connection. So I wish we could have all 50 million like that. Of course, this also depends on the regulatory framework. So let's not forget that um, regulatory innovation is also about business model innovation in energy. And I think there is a lot of work to do as well. That's one example. Another example is clearly when we built a city quarter, large building with, say, 80 
apartment buildings. There's a heating system and a cooling system. We can maybe use access heat from a data center. We can connect that building to the next building or to a business center where they need cooling. So we have kind of a mirror image of, of, of the energy need. And that means we are becoming more efficient. So also the rebuilding of cities, even when customers don't notice, is we create the necessary connections and that also pays off into the 50 million connections. Right. So these are not only 50 million customers in the future, they will be all organized in networks and they will be connected. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you treat them as their own ecosystem. Absolutely. Work. Absolutely. Interesting. So what is Eon's strategy on lowering the batteries for data connectivity to support the third party developer ecosystem? No, the barriers. Okay, I, I understood oh, better. Barriers, the barriers uh, for data connectivity. Well, um, there's work to be done, clearly. Um, but I, I think what we what we do do is, for instance, like take, let's take the software use for the home that has different use cases. And we integrate, for instance, other use cases that other people may want to provide. So uh, it could be either measurement of, of CO2 in real time. It could be a remote service uh, solution. So in, in terms of the architecture that we provide, there are, we do invite partners to actually enable that. Mm -hmm. I would say it's still some more work to do, but I think we have to join forces and invite more innovative uh, people around us to participate in that. So in that respect, you, you almost facilitate and you, you become the matchmaker between different parties involved. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we do this already, you know, um, also not just with small companies. Um, we invite, uh, when we have a software solution or an IT solution, we invite so-called Stadtwerke in Germany to participate. And um, it's, it's, it's actually the age of cooperation. And I think the days are over when you have a challenge ahead of you in that, of that size. Uh, it's actually about how we work together and not treat each other just as competitors because the challenge and the opportunity as well is big enough for everyone. So that I think is also an important part What how we are changing as E.ON, the conversations we have on a regional, on a community level to cooperate and collaborate. This is very important. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to using what you already have, there's a question by Gerhard who gets a lot of attention I see right now. Uh, how do we get all customers connected to the smart world and shouldn't we use the smart meters to do this? Well, that goes back to the other question. What's one of our biggest challenges is right. clearly in Germany, for, for instance, the smart meter rollout, yeah, where we have made it so complex that kind of, you know, we're still lagging behind. Um, so first, um, smart meters is absolutely critical so we can actually manage and communicate with the smallest units of the system uh, on the edge. So this is absolutely fundamental. And on top of the smart meter, you can think of different services, you know, actually managing appliances if you wanted to, using the current and analyzing the current is one example. So this is very critical. And I wish that the regulator maybe w and the different parties would find a better sol solution to accelerate that. In other markets where I think it has gone fastest is if you treat the meter first, the smart meter is also part of your asset infrastructure on the grid side because all the grid companies and the hundreds of grid companies uh, in, in Germany, when they roll it out, they get the job done. And I think this is the thing where we just need to get the job done. Um, and I hope we, we will get there. Okay. Um. There's a question about your future profits. Um, and I see, I mean, this is a question of either or, who are you going to focus on? But really the question is maybe where is your priority for the next years? So will E.ON be focusing on businesses, municipalities, or on the end consumer? Yeah. So first of all, if you think about the energy transition and what needs to happen, all the demand of renewables, different assets getting connected, that needs to be managed by the networks. Mm -hmm. So the infrastructure investment that is needed is, is enormous. And that is where the growth in particular comes from. The second point I would make is, the second big challenge is, we do have to rebuild the cities. We have to rebuild the energy system for industries mm -hmm. on the grid edge. And this is the second big source 
of growth, which also will translate into our profit. And clearly, because E.ON is someone who serves every single one, we will still supply, obvi obviously, customers in mass market um, with energy. So um, we are not exclusive, but if you think about where to really tackle the challenge and to make the difference, it's also on the system side, and this is where the growth comes from. All right, so there is a, a question about E.ON Home and how important it is for the end consumer to have platforms like E.ON Home. Is there really a lot of interest in this? Is there a need for this? Well, I think um, as you, as you, as you, when you, as you also see today, the type of solutions we talk about are manifold. There is not a silver bullet. And I think that we also have to rebuild residential homes with solar, with batteries, with charging stations is clear. So there is a big market out there. Um, and I think we are about actually enabling communities, creating communities, enabling this connection. And this connection also happens, happens on the residential level. So in this sense, it's also a brand promise, what we stand for. And I think um, in this space, by the way, we partner also a lot. And I think what is important for customers to have a trusted partner that can manage actually quite a complex value chain and a partner where customers can also be sure of they are still there in a few years' time to come. Mm -hmm. And I think that reliability, that's also what we stand for, is critical. So yes, that is a market. But if you think of the big, big challenge, also what we can offer, it is in particular on the energy infrastructure on the more systemic side. Mm. And when we look at the, the system that you're already serving, here's a question about uh, the countries that you might expand to. Uh, and how many countries are you working now? And what's the plan for the future of EON? Where are you going next? Well, 15 countries uh, in general today, not everywhere fully fledged infrastructure, but that is a massive footprint. Um, before, I'd say um, we need to think of new countries. I think there is so much work to do mm -hmm. in the countries we are already in. Uh, that I would say it's also about focus there. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, so we're not short of uh, opportunities. Um, I have a question here um, that I would like to ask. Which, which competitor of E.ON do you consider especially innovative? And what could you learn from them? <laughs> Is there one you would mention? Well, um, it, what I'm saying now is not a standard uh, statement. I think, first of all, I take every single competitor very seriously and I look very closely at them and what they do and I have and I've always had a lot of respect for competitors no matter what they do there's not a single one where I say they are so good everyone is good at, at something and there are pretty good guys out there in our industry and uh, the question then is who takes it really to the say next frontier mm -hmm. um, in, in energy uh, I would say there are different different pockets of absolute excellence. And I think um, I have a lot of respect for the systemic view of, of, um, of Tesla mm -hmm. and how they think about entering new market opportunities. It's, of course, based on a great entrepreneurial, say, mindset. But when you look at what they built, it's also about the architecture that sits underneath. So what we learned from that is we have to pay much more attention to the architecture, how we build things. A lot of in this very fast moving world over there is out there is on top of things, over the top. But a lot of stuff happens under the hood. So I, I think um, those competitors are um, uh, something that I, I, I have a lot of time for. But we have competitors out there that have um, operational excellence. You know, they, they, they run their stuff extremely well. And by the way, uh, when it comes to networks and infrastructure in general, we're not too bad either. But I also believe in the principle of humility to say, keep the feet on the ground and better learn than to be too happy about yourself. Yeah, I'm not sure that's Tesla's view, um, but it's a very German view on things, I would say. Well, uh, I, I can't comment on them. Uh, what I can say is that um, every single company that makes it to become big, eventually they will face the same legacy challenges that the established companies face. Um, and I still believe that regardless of nationality, humility is a good concept. Very good. Um, 
Speaking of legacy, is uh, the conventional battery storage out of the game? Um, and do we rely on gas, as you mentioned before? No. Uh, a great question. So first, I think what you see on the battery side, um, lithium-ion battery, maybe solid-state batteries at some point, it's quite amazing what happens in material science if you look at the decline of cost, if you look at the decline of capacity in only a few years, um, that is pretty impressive. So clearly, um, electric storage in batteries uh, is, is an important cornerstone. But batteries are not necessarily suited for storage over weeks, months time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but they, of course they can, but there are better long-term storage and that's usually in form of gas. So I'm very positive and bullish about um, batteries. What was announced the other week with the cost degression of 40% reached uh, or capacity increase at the same time. That's quite impressive. That is not the end. I think we will see some extreme miracles over time uh, also in that space, which is unusual in solid state, but it actually does happen. Um, there's a lot of hope and a lot of hype around hydrogen as an energy source. Um, could hydrogen be the fuel of the future? What is your stand on that? It could be, and personally, I'd hope so. And what is very important to understand is this will still take some time. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, in order to be successful at a larger scale in 10 years, we have to start now also with the level of ambition we have today. Because these things still need investment, they need brain power, they need testing on a large scale. So what the government is doing and what Europe is doing is absolutely right. We have to control a little bit the hype in terms of expectations. Um, and a lot of questions still need to be solved in, in, in terms of where does the green power actually come from that is supposed to produce the green hydrogen? What about blue hydrogen or a different mixtures of hydrogen, which might also be relevant? If you then think, how do we get the hydrogen from sun-rich areas like Africa, Australia, to us in Europe, then a question about transportation. Mm -hmm. How does the logistics infrastructure look like? What's also, I think, critical, in country, we still need networks. So we, need, we have a gas infrastructure. So important will be that we maintain and enable the existing gas infrastructure to make sure it can also is, is, is hydrogen ready. So it's a, like a big puzzle with lots of pieces. But when you have a big puzzle, you don't solve it very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have to start, usually you start actually from different corners. And I think it's similar here. So I'm very hopeful when it comes to hydrogen. There, is, uh, there was a question um, about data privacy in Germany uh, as an inhibitor uh, some, or something, an obstacle maybe to using data and uh, especially data that you might want to use to get to the efficiency and uh, convenience and greenness of the system that you're looking for. Our last keynote yesterday was from Microsoft, um, their environmental impact section. And uh, looking at the use of data, that will become more and more important. Is the German system in the way? Is it, is it going to help? Or how do you see that use of data? Yeah. Uh, extremely relevant, broad question. Um, let me try to dissect some aspects. The first thing to always make clear is privacy data protection is essential from is an essential human right. And as a company, we have a commercial contract, but we also have a social contract. And that means when we are dealing with customers, our job and our promise is we will look after your data and make sure it's safe. And we don't do anything you wouldn't give us permission. I think that is generally a very good starting point. Now, then the question is, does that necessarily lead to the fact that we can't do anything? Mm -hmm. And this is, I think, where the thing breaks down. Because you can do a lot more with data without breaching that. And I think somewhere in between some of the conversations, um, I think we got a bit wrong. That said, there's always a risk and we still need to debate that. And my last point on this one is clearly when it comes to energy, you need a smart meter. So if you spend years to make the smart meter safer than Fort Knox, you make it so complex that you can't get the thing produced and implemented, don't be surprised that you don't have smart meters yet. 
And um, I think other countries also take privacy extremely seriously, and they are already in rollout number two. So um, I think a bit more pragmatism, always on the basis of the fundamental principle. Much more is possible. Thank you so much, Dr. Wilberger, for your insights and Thank for you. answering so many questions. Thanks so much for your listening and all your questions. Uh, we did not go through all of them, but uh, we're out of time for this session. We'll be back at 12 p.m. right here. <laughs>